I enjoyed that. Very nice. The message this morning, I'm going to talk about James and his journey. We speak about James and the epistle of James. And uh, the epistles are addressed to the churches. Well, the epistles of Paul were addressed to the churches and people in Rome and Corinth, Philippi, and to Timothy and Titus and Philemon and, other one, and others. But James' epistle is one of the seven general epistles. It's not addressed to, it's addressed to Christians, but it's not addressed to anyone in particular, any group in particular. And there's seven of them. There's James, there's first and second Peter, first and second, third John, and Jude and Revelation. James is the general epistle. <clears throat> the, authorship, the authorship is James, but which James? Because there's more than one James. There's James, the Lord's brother. There's James and John, the sons of Zebedee. There's James, the son of Alphaeus. So which James is it? Well, church tradition assigns the authorship to James, James the Just, who was James the Lord's brother. He was also known as James the Just. He was a half-brother of Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Uh, Mark 6, 1 to 3 mentions, <coughs> mentions them that Jesus went out from there to have country. His disciples followed him, and when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things, and what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? And then they said, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? And brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. So Jesus was, uh, James was the oldest of Jesus' brothers and sisters. He's mentioned first, and that indicates that he was the oldest. The other James mentioned in the Bible, well, we have the list of the disciples, Matthew 10, verse 1, and uh, he, when he had called the 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Then James, the son of Zebedee. That's another James. And John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, and James, the son of Alphaeus and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So James, the brother of John, uh, son of Zebedee, was killed by Herod, in Herod Agrippa I in 44 AD, and he's not considered well, he's considered to be, have been dead before the book of James was written. Um, in Acts 12, now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He was one of the disciples, spent a lot of time with Jesus, but he was felt to be dead before the book was written. And James, the son of Alphaeus, is not even considered to have written it. He's one of the twelve. He's also known as James the Less or the Minor. And tradition does not assign any authorship of it to him. This James was interesting. He was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. He was with Christ a lot in his youth. And... Uh, Whenever his parents would, his parents went up twice a year to Jerusalem. Family went up twice a year to Jerusalem, and the parents were probably busy looking after the younger children. Whenever they were returning from Jerusalem at the feast when Jesus was twelve, and he went missing, they went to the feast of the Passover. 
When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So they weren't concerned about him at first. They were probably busy with the younger children and taking care of them. And there was relatives there as well, so they probably weren't very worried about him. But they did not find him. They returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now it was that after three days they found him. And most parents would be beside themselves, as they say, after three days if you haven't found someone. And they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said, son, why have you done this to us? So they were probably busy with the younger children and uh, didn't miss him at first. But James was around. He was very much, would have been very much aware of what Jesus, that Jesus had gone missing. And, uh, and uh, would have known what happened. But during Jesus' ministry, his brothers didn't really, his family didn't really believe in him, his brothers and sisters. In, in John 6, uh, some, quite a few turned away from Jesus. And uh, Peter, he asked Simon Peter, were you going to turn away as well? And Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And also we come, have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter knew who Jesus was. But in the next chapter, John 7, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand. His brother therefore, brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go to Judea that your disciples must see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. His brothers told him that, but the next verse says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. At this time, his brothers didn't believe in him. This was before the crucifixion. It seemed that Jesus, that after Jesus' resurrection, his brothers, or James, seemed to then believe in him. James was a witness of the resurrection. In Corinthians, Paul tells us that um, the brethren, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached, which, and uh, he delivered it first. I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and that he arose again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the 12 disciples. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James, it mentions James specifically. He was seen by James and then by the apostles. So James was very much aware, and at that point he had become a believer in Jesus. After that, he, when he was, and it would seem that James made a, Jesus made a special appearance to James. Commentators feel that James was James had just. This was James the Just, the Lord's brother, and he became a devoted follower of Jesus. James the Just, James was a, a leader or a pillar of the church in Jerusalem. In the Bible, James was in Jerusalem when Peter fled and uh, that's the story, we read a few verses of it earlier in Acts chapter 12. Hadn't read it for, for a while. It was interesting to, to read it again. Acts chapter 12. 
first few verses is when he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before, to bring him before the people after the Passover. And uh, Peter was freed from prison. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And this was the early church. It was right after the crucifixion, shortly after that. And, uh, and when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. And so he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel. Did not know that what, that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past, they were, when they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of their own accord. And they went out and went down to the street. Immediately, the angel departed. Get up a little bit here. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from the expectation of the, of the Jewish people. And he came to the house, and the young girl, he knocked on the door, and she was excited, but she didn't open the door. And she recognized Peter's voice because of the gladness. She did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. And they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. And Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door, he saw they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell, thing, go tell these things to James to, and to the brethren. He specifically asked him to tell it to James. And James and Peter were both pillars at the church at that time. And James fled, or Peter fled Jerusalem at that time to escape Herod, till Herod's death. And this had to have a, an impact, a, a huge impact on James, to, to, the church praying for it, the prison opened, Peter escaping and being able to to flee. And James is known for, for his dedication and his prayers and going to the temple to pray a lot. He, in fact, he earned himself the nickname Old Camel Knees because his knees were calloused from his much praying. And that's what, the nickname that, that he was given. So we see that James plays a part in different, in, in different events in the, in the New Testament. This, the next time we see James, there's a dispute over the Gentiles coming to Christ and, and, and had to do with circumcision. Then the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And, and, the, and verse 19, not trouble these among the Gentiles who are turning to God. And there was a dispute what to do about Gentiles. Should they, should they be circumcised when they come into the church? And 
different things. And James made the leadership decision. He stood up and uh, he told them not to trouble these people anymore. That they were turning to God. So James was in a position, a pillar in the church in Jerusalem. Pauline epistles in the later chapters, the Acts of the Apostles portrayed James as an important figure in the Christian community of Jerusalem. And later in Galatians, Paul visited Jerusalem and he spent 15 days with Peter. And the only other disciple he saw was James, the, the brother of the Lord. So the prominent position that James took. James' epistle teaches us how to walk and how to conduct ourselves. Paul has told us what to believe, and Peter tells us to have hope and to have an answer to every man that asks for the hope that lies in us. John tells us to love. Jude tells us to stay pure. James teaches us how to walk and how to conduct ourselves. James wants us to become Christ-like, to have a faith and a righteousness, to live godly. The book of James was written between 40 and 60 AD, possibly closer to 44 AD, but it's not known exactly. This is how James describes himself. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, that's James 1 and verse 1. James doesn't describe himself by any title. He could have claimed to have been a pillar of the church, a leader in the church in Jerusalem. He could have claimed to be Jesus' brother or half-brother, which he was. He could have used that as his credentials or his claim to fame, but he doesn't. He describes himself as a bondservant of God and of Jesus Christ. The bondservant is an important word. It translates the ancient Greek word doulos, and a slave, a bondservant, is one who is a, in a permanent relation of servitude to another. So James described himself as a servant, as a slave, in a permanent relationship to Jesus. And we are in that relationship as well. And when he uses the word Lord in, in, the verse, in verse 1, he says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's felt in, when he uses it here, that he trans translated the ancient Greek word curious, and it means James considered Jesus to be God. He was his brother growing up, but now he saw him as a, in a different light, as God and part of the Godhead. And in that verse, he's, in the way it's, it's used in that verse, it shows that James was looking at him as God rather than a brother, his brother. James, a bondservant of God, Although he was a half-brother, he described himself as a servant. Nobody made him do it. He was a slave by choice, a servant of God. And uh, his, uh, his phrases implies the absence of rights, total dependence on the master, and complete obedience. And uh, James, I should open the book here. James also mentions the, the 12 tribes, or Israel. He's addressing this to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, those, the Jews were scattered at different times, and there was diaspora or dispersion, and ministering to them, but also ministering to others that were Christians. So he's addressing this book to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And then, 
in verse 2 to 4. It's a little bit hard to uh, fathom what he's getting at here, but my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And trials are considered to be the little things that bother us from day to day, the big things that bother us from day to day, the health issues we may have, employment issues, all of these things are considered to be trials. And uh, he's telling us to count it all joy. And uh, some say the joy comes when it's over. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And uh, James does not mean that the only joy in a Christian's life comes from adversity. Trials is a testing of any kind. Testing your faith will be stretched and problems and the challenges. And it's difficult to count it all joy, but knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And the word there, um, it doesn't mean the patience that you have when you sit waiting for the dentist to come and take you in or the doctor or someone like that. It doesn't mean the patience you have when you're sitting waiting to catch a fish. But it's, it's not a passive waiting. It's an endurance or perseverance. It's like you're running a marathon and, uh, and you're halfway there and you'd like to quit, but it's that endurance, that patience that keeps you going to the end. And that's what's meant here. The patience that uh, the testing of your faith produces an enduring, persevering type of patience. It means to Stay of the course helps you finish a project during patience that or perseverance that helps you finish a class in school or a course you might be taking to stay the course and not give up. And the Christians at this time were going through a tough time with persecutions and, and the difficult. Counting it all joy is difficult, but he says to count it all joy. John 16, 33 said, Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The war is over, but we still have some battles. We're still fighting our battles down here. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And as someone said, others have taken the test before us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And there are many examples in the Old Testament. Charles Spurgeon says, trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and they let us see what we are made of. And James 1 verse 4 talks about, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And perfect implies and maturity or a ripeness. And we become to the point of maturity as Christians. Complete is the freedom from the blemish, freedom from uh, blemishes and uh, all Christ, you know, we're not lacking any virtues, any Christian virtues. James 5 to 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. 
For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. A lot of concepts in those few verses. Wisdom is a great theme throughout James's letter. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. God is the source of wisdom. Um, he gives it liberally without reproach. We need wisdom to discern events in our lives, to discern or make, to make our decisions. We need God's wisdom when our life is in difficult circumstances. We ask God for that wisdom, and he gives it liberally. He doesn't distinguish between one and the other and give it to one and not the other. Without reproach, he doesn't despise our request. God speaks to us through his word, his wisdom. We find a wisdom in God's word. We ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the, by the wind. A ship is unst as unstable as a ship on the sea, or like a drunken man when we doubt. For let not the man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. We ask in faith, in faith without doubting God's desire or ability to give us that wisdom. Don't ex we don't expect to see anything when we doubt. Doubter clings to the promise, and then he's sure it won't be fulfilled. Unstable in all his ways, double-minded. Waves don't rest. Waves are unstable, and so is the doubter, and capable of great destruction. Double-minded, we ask God in a doubting way. In wrapping up, I have a few other notes about James, James and his journey. Uh, James, he became known for his piety and was named James the Just. Tradition has it he was a Nazarite from his mother's womb, abstaining from strong drink and animal food and wearing linen. He was the writer of the pistol bearing his name, which has been attributed to James the Just but such was his character that he styled himself not as the brother, but only the servant or slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was cruelly martyred by the scribes and Pharisees who cast him from the pinnacle of the temple. As the fall did not kill him, his enemies stoned him. That was around 62 AD. So we see from our journey with James, he was the Lord's brother, named James the Just, nicknamed Old Camel Knees. He was aware of Christ being in the temple, teaching and asking questions. James did not believe in Jesus before the resurrection. Christ showed himself to James after the resurrection. He was a pillar in the Jerusalem church. He was informed of Peter's miraculous escape from prison. He made the decision when Paul and Barnabas brought a matter to the council at Jerusalem, was over circumcision, described himself as a slave of Christ. And he goes on to encourage us and pray for the wisdom, have the faith, the endurance, the perseveration, per perseverance that we need. I'd like to close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Once again, we ask, Father, that this COVID will soon pass and we can meet as we normally do in fellowship and enjoy each other company to a fuller extent. We put that in your hands. We ask, Father, that you will help us to have the faith and the wisdom and the perseverance that James encourages us to have. We ask, Father, that you'll be with us during the coming week and help us to stay safe and to stay healthy. And we thank you for all your many blessings now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.